thank you uh, for having me and um, for being here in New Zealand for the very first time. Uh, I am, uh, I'm from Wales, so you're not going to get any soft little Richie McCaw kind of nice comments from me, just, just, just letting you know that. Um, I run Sustainly, which is a new knowledge platform all around successful sustainability communication. It's based on four pillars. The idea that to actually understand how to communicate sustainability, you've got to understand the issues, you've got to understand the risks, you've got to understand the innovation, and you've got to understand the storytelling. And Sustainly grows out of a piece of research and a piece of work I've been doing for five years, which is called the Social Media Sustainability Index. And it's that nexus of sustainability and social media that will, well, that governs a lot of the thinking that I do and actually takes us through today how some of the biggest companies in the world are communicating sustainability. So, I want to take you back. Oh, for the younger people in the room, that's Charlton Heston, by the way. <laughs> you, can, you can look him up online. Who used to control information before all those blogs and those Facebooks and those Twitters and blah, blah, blah came along? It was the people with power. It was governments. It was big companies. It was the media. They were the people who could convey and control the information that we received. And if we, the people, wanted to say something back, well, in terms of media, we had to write a letter to the editor, and we know how far that got us. If it was government, we had to write a letter. Actually, I think we just saw where all those letters ended up in that, <laughs> in that pile. If you were a company, well, they created customer service to help us, right? And we know just how bad customer service used to be. Well, that was 10 years ago. The past decade has seen a sea change in the way that we all communicate online. And essentially what it's done, oh, first of all, it's given everyone a voice. So first rule of this type of presentation, put a cute kid in there, because you win about half the room over anyway. So when you're doing your little voting thing, Keep me in mind on that, all right? Now listen, this kid, or these kids, are us. And they have scared the hell out of government business and big media. And here's the reason why. Because if we went back to Charlton Heston, as Moses, he was on high handing down proclamations, which was what all business, government, and media used to do. I'm now going to mess with Periscope, which is filming me live. Because what social media has done has taken me, big business, I know I look, what corporation would I be? I wonder. Anyway. And it's moved me in up here with you, the people. And you get to tell me what you think about me. And you get to tell me what you think about me. And you get to tell me what you think about me. And frankly, I'm pretty scared at the moment. Because this is not the comfort zone that myself, as a big, bold, impressive corporation, is used to be dealing with. And that has caused, I'm coming back, don't worry. And that has caused a massive change in the way that business thinks about how it engages that little buzzword we love using with its different stakeholders of the buzzword we like using. That's the end of me preaching, okay? That's kind of my kind of political kind of thought. But it does inform where we're going. Now, the other thing that has changed, we used to think of the internet. And I'm old enough to go back to the World Wide Web days, when there was this thing of the information superhighway, right? We know this, this online, all this information powering down. Very impressive. Social media broke that highway. And what social media did is it actually changed the way we communicated into what I would call a niche of interconnected country lanes. Yes, that's a very abstract visualization of a country lane. I'm, I'm, I grant you that, but I was in sort of kind of a, an arty type of mode when I came up with this. What that means, essentially, 
But it's just as everyone has the power to publish nowadays, everyone has the power to choose the information they want. And whatever issue they care about, you can be pre pretty sure there will be X number of blogs, Facebook pages, Twitter feeds, all about it, right? So who loves fly fishing in this room? I thought you probably did. I could see that. So 10 years ago, if you wanted to find information about fly fishing, you'd have to go to Field and Stream magazine, or you'd have to go to a local group around it. But now, they're inundated with information. And so that's the key thing I'm talking about here. We can find it. And that is really interesting and powerful for companies and the world of sustainability. And this is where I believe social media and sustainability come together, and why they are so crucial and important together. Because, and this got lost somewhere along the line, social media was meant to be transformative for business. It was meant to shake things up and bring big business to account. Because guess what? Brands and corporations weren't the ones who invented this. They weren't even invited into the party of social media back in 2004, 2005. In many ways, social media, as it grew up, as blogs and message boards in the corporate realm, was a reaction to big business. It was a reaction to really bad customer service. It was a reaction to products that weren't working properly. Somewhere along the line, that got lost, and it became just another big sales marketing tool for business, which is why we all feel inundated and turned off by company brand messages in Facebook. So strip that away and go back to the pure purpose of what social media meant, and then think about the pure purpose of what sustainability means as a driving force for business. And what you have is four things in common that bind them together and in theory should make good business anyway, right? Authenticity, transparency, a sense of community, and creativity. You bring all those together, and you can be very successful in how you communicate. The great thing, in terms of sustainability, is that social media gives you a massive new audience. Second rule of presentation, stick a bit of Lego in. You get the other side of the room. It's easy. My gizmo points are just skyrocketing at the moment. This is great, right? Because traditionally, CSR, and as it morphed, thank goodness, into more purpose and business-driven sustainability, was speaking to a fairly small group of stakeholders. And unfortunately, CSR and sustainability communications have been shaped towards those audiences for too long. Kind of dry, bit worthy, save the world? No. That isn't how sustainability is going to drive success in business and connect with communities. So social media gives you a brand new audience, which is great to talk about sustainability, except no one has a clue outside of this room, real people doing real things. They have no clue what sustainability means. Talk to them about sustainable, like, they look at you like you're from a different planet. It's become the buzzword that joins all of you together, that makes you feel very driven and powerful, and yet is almost useless in the real world. And that poses a major communication problem for what you're trying to do. <laughs> I love the hippie guy. <clears throat> so, the first rule, the first mantra, I would say, is don't mention the S word. This is the Eden Project in Cornwall, in England. You might have heard of England. It's this small place next to Wales. 
Yeah, okay, good. We we'll brain get you on board on that. Um, now, the Eden Project, of course, is pretty much all about sustainability. And yet, its front-facing staff are not allowed to use the term with customers, with visitors, because they don't want to lose the power of what they're conveying. All right, so that's a conundrum, isn't it? We have amazing stories to tell about what's going in the organization, in the company, in your form of the business. And yet, the tools that we have to communicate, traditionally, don't mean anything to real people outside. So, what are we gonna do? I would like to suggest to you that we are entering an age of what I call soft sustainability. Now, I need you, we're in a university environment. I want you to put on your kind of wonky, geeky kind of political theory hats for a moment and go with me on a journey back to the late 1980s when a guy called Joseph Nye, probably many of you aren't old enough to remember this, such a young, good-looking crowd. Joseph Nye was uh, an economist, a political thinker, and part of Bill Clinton's uh, government. And he's best known for coming up with a book called Soft Power, and a political theory of soft power. And soft power pretty much went like this, that the power of the United States culturally, through Hollywood and through its brands, had far more clout, importance, and sway to influence what went on in the world than invading and blowing shit up. All right, so the message didn't really go down very well. With it didn't get, but anyway, the principle, I believe, works for sustainability, for how you guys think about communicating with audiences online, but externally anyway, is that the stories you have, the elements, the issues, the soft elements of sustainability are incredibly powerful and connect incredibly well to your audience. But the term sustainability is that big stick that they don't really understand. So what do I mean by this? Look at collectively. Have you all come across collectively? Do you know what it is? Collectively is a platform, a media operation launched by Vice, or actually Vice's um, media um, kind of agency on virtue, and funded and underwritten by 20 global companies, uh, including the likes of Marks and Spencers, uh, Coca-Cola, Unilever, uh, Google, as a way of talking about sustainability issues to a millennium generation without having to bore them stupid with the word sustainability. Here's Lego again. Everything is awesome. That is the biggest banner for soft sustainability. Subversive, anti-corporate as normal messaging as you're likely to get in one of the biggest films of last year. My kids love that film. They get the message explicitly without ever having to use the word sustainability. Levi's, this is the more specific thing, but Levi's, right? To build community, to understand, and this actually shows also how broad sustainability has grown in terms of how companies have influence and what they need to think about. Levi's put a global effort into building skateboard parks in different parts of the world where either society is challenged around the infrastructure, where the community, the skate community, is vilified by government and local authorities. And it created a whole documentary series around elevating and pushing forward the values of skateboarding from a community feel as part of its own social actions. Or, I'll give you another example. This is the wonderful campaign in France that is now being aped and mirrored. Anyone doing this here? Any company doing this here in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, if you're for a big, you know, if a big supermarket chain in here in New Zealand, copy this right away, it's brilliant. <coughs> this is France's Intermarché, their inglorious fruit, a way of influencing shoppers, of consumers, 
that guess what? You don't have to use perfect, you don't have to buy perfect food. Food waste, I'm sure, in this country from shopping, from supermarkets is a huge issue. In the UK, something like 30% of food that we buy is thrown away. Never mind what actually doesn't get to the supermarket because it doesn't look nice enough. This was a way through soft sustainability of promoting the issue. OK, so that's in general what I mean by soft sustainability. Let me give you 10 tips for the way you should think about engaging, reaching, talking with consumers, your other stakeholders, in a way that won't alienate them in the way they'll enjoy, in the way they'll actually resonate with them based on what major brands are doing and companies, OK? First one is know your audience, right? There is, I'll talk about this in, in, uh, in the workshop I run this morning and in other things I'm doing here. But if you think about it, my background is, is in journalism. And if you think about how do you actually engage with an audience, how do you successfully communicate, it's actually really, really simple in theory. It's really, really hard in practice. But basically, there are three key things you have to think about. You have to know who your audience is, right? If you're going to tell a story, if you're going to run a campaign, you've got to know who that audience is. You've got to think, what have I got to say that meets the needs of that audience? And you actually have to think, where does my audience, where does my community like getting its information from? Because there's no point, is there, coming up with a great story and putting it somewhere where no one bothers to go. IBM, using Tumblr, combines all of those things. But the first thing it knows is it knows its audience. So this is IBM, right, which IBM, of course, has done smarter cities, smarter planet, has built a whole, basically, brand ethos, but actually kind of business driver around smart, smarter planet, smarter cities. It has become, and it's a top down from its CEO, which means that it flows throughout the whole company, which means that marketing gets on board in a big way, becomes it's very effective. Some of those areas get communicated in different channels in different ways. But IBM chose to use the blogging community platform Tumblr to tell part of its story. And the reason it did it is because it knew that Tumblr, on top of doing lots of kind of community blogs around really cute cats and lots about food, I've been on there a lot, um, also has a really strong technology, geeky, fandom kind of community. And IBM, through Smarter Planet, has lots of really good geeky visual assets, stories that it can tell that would get buried other places. And this is where another thing I'll talk about later on today, an element of a magazine mentality comes in. Is that we used to think, right, in terms of communicating, that you could only do it through big brand campaigns because no one cared about anything else. Everything else, just stick it in a press release. Well, the whole thing that social brought was an ability to tell a story ongoing, in small ways, in ongoing ways, in ways that maybe you hadn't thought about before, that big brand, the big advertising would never have considered. This editorial thinking has led to companies and brands choosing platforms like Tumblr to tell its story, not in a massive way, but finding a particular audience that it communicate with. So IBM, IBM got it because it could run these visually appealing elements of sustainability communication through Tumblr, but it also knew its audience because, look, it called itself IBM Blur, which is kind of a nice, cute showing that it was on message, so to speak. Dove and Unilever do a very similar thing. This is, uh, you know, Dove brand globally. Is Dove here in New Zealand? Yeah? Okay. So I didn't do my Dove homework before I came. Sorry. Um, it has made female self-esteem a very important issue for it as a brand. And I know we can be cynical about all these things, but it has, 
is putting a lot of money behind it and is putting a lot of expertise around it behind as well. As well. They use Snapchat to host basically a guidance counseling session for young women who wanted to talk about self-esteem issues with experts. And why did they choose Snapchat? Social media question for 10. Yeah, because it's for young people, but something very particular about Snapchat. Sorry, what did someone say? There you go. That, that man who had his second cup of coffee and so was on it. That's what I like. It deletes what you've done after 10 seconds. So it was now in the moment quick social, but it also was disposable and, in theory, protecting the elements of the people who are doing it. Really good example of knowing your audience and connecting on an issue. Number two is know what you have to say. This will be the end of my Unilever kind of screed, because everyone talks about Unilever, right? Um, we can all, you know. Unilever launched Project Sunlight about 18 months ago, a platform, a very bold, ambitious platform, a little bit like collectively, but bringing all of its global brands and highlighting specific sustainability storytelling issues from those global brands. Now, what is the first, well, not the first rule, but one of the major rules of publishing is don't promise what you can't deliver. Too many times companies, brands, launch a big site or something, and they just don't have the resources to keep it going. They've thought the great idea, they haven't thought the nitty gritty around it. Unilever knew what it had to say, and it also identified sustainability, soft sustainability brand stories that could run through. So it did the thinking. Know what you do well. And this, of course, is the by now very famous Nike making app, where it took its whole materiality matrix of what makes sustainable materials, what makes sustainable design, and created it and put it in an app and offered it to free to any designers around the world. So they, too, could tap into the knowledge that Nike has built over 20 years and create their own thing. So it's being useful, but also knowing what they do well. Know your strengths and your weaknesses. This is Chipotle's Scarecrow campaign. Everyone knows this, right? So Chipotle, the really, really good sustainable fast food chain in America, which has made very big inroads, and, but also very big claims about sourcing, not using antibiotics in its food, created this beautiful piece of agiprop, a video that basically, basically just beats up on McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken without ever mentioning them, but laid Chipotle open to very serious scrutiny and criticism about what it was doing itself. And it's a cautionary tale, because Chipotle is doing really, really good work. But by going into something as bold as this, by telling almost an allegory in this way through a game and a film, it itself couldn't live up to the vision it was projecting. So that's a cautionary tale when we think about sustainability storytelling. And it's why, quite often, sustainability experts are really, really scared about working with marketing and communications. Because they want it to be right, and they know that marketing and comms want it to be right as well, but they really want to tell a pretty good story. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And something is going to, anyway, been there. <laughs> know how to be transparent. So we'll see again in, uh, in, in the workshop and in other stuff I do that McDonald's has been beaten up, as you probably know, uh, in recent years through social media. But also it's been beaten up on share price uh, by the likes of Chipotle and by disturbing stories about sourcing transparency. So 
This is a global campaign. I know it's here in New Zealand as well. It's launched in, uh, in, in Canada first. It's called Our Food, Your Questions. And what they basically did through a controlled way, but also through live Facebook chats, was ask people, tell us what you really think about our food. What, what are your fears about it? Is chicken nuggets really made out of pink slime? And we will actually demonstrate to you the sourcing, the reality that goes. It's a, it's a really, really scary thing for a brand, for a company to do, and probably might not have happened had McDonald's not actually been quite scared about its, its, uh, its market position. But you have to applaud them for being really transparent in that way. Know how to be creative. Now, this one's a tricky one, right? Because this is Coca-Cola. And there's all this news coming through in recent months about Coca-Cola funding academic research that's promoting the idea that if you just exercise, you can just get rid of calories, blah, 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 as opposed to actually diet and how much stuff you put in you has, a, has a, you know, an effect as well. And obviously, sugar. Coca-Cola Coca has a big sugar issue at the moment as well. But I like this, and I tell you why. Because it's a very creative way of demonstrating that there is a cause and effect and a sustainability effect of what you do. And this was a piece of experiential <sighs> pop art, in a way, in Santa Monica, California, where Coca-Cola hooked up a bicycle to an elaborate sort of, you know, um, contraption to a vending machine and invited people to get on the bike and pedal to the point where they had burned off 140 calories. And at that point, and only at that point, would the vending machine kick out the can of Coke. So Coca-Cola has big issues in this space. But in terms of being creative and actually saying, guess what? There is a cause and effect of, of sugar and what we do. It wasn't a bad way of doing it. And you can be creative even when the topic isn't. And I want to show you this video now in a second, because this is General Electric and its work uh, on intermodal transport. That's pretty sexy, isn't it? Intermodal transport. The video I'm going to show you has been viewed about 400,000 times and takes one of the most boring but yet sustainable way of mass transportation and brings it to life. Can we play the video or bits of it? That, that's the universal sign for please turn down the video. It's like, uh, works in Wales, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> to communicate something boring in an interesting way with sustainability undertones, they went to a house DJ in the UK and created a whole rhythmic set for this video. It became an underground house hit, all about intermodal transport. You see, you don't get that stuff normally. <clears throat> know how to be useful. All right, so this is a piece of work actually that we did um, in some of the advisory work that we do through, through Sustainly. And this is using Oculus Rift, you know, the uh, virtual reality headsets. And we worked with a client in the UK, EDF Energy, uh, around helping them on sustainability communication for employees. Now, they used to run sustainability training for employees with a 70-page PowerPoint. Not many pictures. <laughs> Wasn't a great, you know, they weren't queuing up to do it. 
we turned that and made it into a seven-minute Oculus Rift experience of learning about recycling, about turning the lights off, about smarter forms of transport. And guess what? Retention was a lot better than the 70-page PowerPoint. But know how to be useful. Again, we talked earlier on about food waste. Sainsbury's worked with Google on an app called Food Rescue to help people identify recipes and also sell-by dates so that they didn't throw food or waste food. A really useful form of communication. And then there's Coca-Cola again. Here we are, we're back with Coca-Cola. Um, with this very interesting campaign that was run through Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia called Second Lives. And we're going to play this video because I don't need to explain it. You will see exactly why it works. So Coca-Cola, for, uh, Coca -Cola for all its other issues, has been very successful in terms of recycling and has a massive recycling issue, but was able to create a good, compelling little piece of innovation and storytelling around that. Number eight is know how to stand up for what you believe. And this is a very simple one. Apple has made a massive stand on gay, lesbian issues even before its CEO, Tim Cook, came out as gay. And this, this was a simple video that they made before Gay Pride in the US last year. And if you know the atmosphere and the political tensions in the US around this issue, it's a very bold statement, as was what Sears has done, which is a classic Midwestern, Illinois-based family values company that actually to help sell and boost its kind of wedding registry did a whole series around gay marriage. Interesting. Know when to partner. And this is a big issue because, you know, even the biggest companies need help in telling stories. And when you're a small company, you really do. Now, not everyone has the budget that, um, that, that Dan On uh, <laughs> has with Activia. But by combining with Shakira on, a, uh, on a, a piece of work to support the World Food Program, it managed to garner something like 45 million views and generate two, two and a half million uh, in donations to the World Food Program. Finally, know how to lead the debate. And companies should lead when they believe and when they know that sustainability is at the heart of what they do and the heart of what their business depends on. And I want to show you a piece of a video now from Volkswagen that will make sense.
that's soft sustainability. Because that is core to not just to Volkswagen, but to the company that actually led this in the, from the start. The movement to ban texting, to discourage, was AT&T, because it was hitting at its core business. It was killing people, but it was hitting its core business. That's sustainability. So, guys, um, in this era of soft sustainability, where you're not going to use that S word, but you're going to connect with real people and make a difference for them and for your business, how will you connect? Will you talk about food? Will you talk about neighbors, about living, dying, your career, their careers, laughing, health, wildlife, security? It doesn't matter how you do it, but you have to connect to them on a personal basis. And the reason is simple. And don't trust me, don't believe me. I want you to take in mind the words of one of America's finest business men, Michael Corleone. It's not personal, it's strictly business. Thank you very much.